So SEG would first and foremost like to thank MacTech for their generous support as our base metal webinars series sponsor. This is the first installment in the SEG 2023 base metals webinar series. It will provide geoscientists with an open forum for interaction with industry and academic experts as they discuss the significance of copper exploration and the massive role that it will play in the evolving energy transition. With demand for copper expected to more than triple in the coming two decades, there is a need for the next generation of geologists to better understand the full scope of the metals value chain and exploration potential. Uh, my name is Lauren Z. For those of you that don't know me, I'm your webinar moderator. I am currently a PhD candidate at the Colorado School of Mines, which is home to the very first student chapter of SEG in the world. I'm also the current SEG Students Committee Chair, so I'm really passionate about student involvement in the society and student support. Please feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn if you are interested, if you're a student and you're interested in economic geology and becoming more involved with SEG. Okay, one more reminder that the main Q&A comes at the end of the webinar. So what we do first is our introductions, presentations. First up is Jamie Brainard, then George Gilchrist and Helen Twig, followed by our panel discussion and open Q&A. You have the ability to put a question in at any time, but please feel free to make use of that Q&A. All right, first up, Jamie Brainard from the United States Geological Survey. Jamie has been a material flow analyst at the National Minerals Information Center at the USGS since 2016. He has a background as a geochemist and an astrobiologist studying the formation of hydrothermal ore deposits and Archean processes at Penn State, following receiving a BS in geosciences from Penn State. His work at the USGS has been on the identification and risk assessment of critical materials with a focus on the geologic accessibility of byproduct commodities and on the international trade flow of those commodities. And with that, Jamie, I'll let you take it away. Thank you very much, Lauren. So it's very exciting to get to talk about this stuff, uh, particularly because it's something that um, I, I get to do as kind of my day job. And it's um, just making sure, Lauren, we got that up and running, right? I don't see your screen yet. So if you can share it. Sorry about that. No, it's fine. I hit the button. I just didn't hit share. There we go. Perfect. I can see it now. Excellent. So uh, again, thank you. Um, and so the one little house cleaning thing, just anything that's shared here as a government employee, um, it's preliminary. So please don't you know, use anything that you see in slides for um, any untowards purposes and will be USGS liable. So um, going into that, one of the things that Lauren had asked us to discuss, because this is an early career format, is what um, what our backgrounds are. And it's kind of been exciting talking to the other presenters and I'm realizing how much I miss field geology because um, I grew up in the coal belts of Pennsylvania. I grew up in quarries, so geology was kind of always in my blood. And then so when I went to Penn State, I studied geosciences and astrobiology, which sounds like a really weird combination. But what I was doing was looking at those Archean uh, hydrothermal systems and saying what they tell us about the depositional environment. Um, what are they bringing in from seawater, the atmosphere, things like that. And so I got to do a lot of really fun field work in places like Australia and Canada, go to the Kid Creek mine, things like that. But my interests were always a little bit more on the um, upstream, sorry, the downstream side of things, you know, and how humans are exploiting them. So what are some of the processing, um, not just the deposit itself, but how are they getting them out? And so when life happened and I moved to Washington, D.C. and got married, I was lucky enough to fall in with the USGS's National Minerals Information Center. So our center is responsible for tracking the production of commodities and their usages. In particular, my center, uh, my section is the Minerals Intelligence Research section. And so we're the ones doing the risk evaluation for critical minerals. So if you've seen in the headlines, um, the federal government's critical minerals minerals list, the methodologies around that, and maybe some of our infographics, um, that's coming out of our shop. And it's really fun because I got to take those diverse interests of, you know, not just being a geologist, but now I'm doing things like tracking commodity trade, which is something I never uh, had a background in or would have come across. And so because there's a lot of early career folks, if you are interested in those larger implications, I highly suggest sort of, uh, searching us out. Um, we're on USA Jobs. Um, it's a kind of a hokey process, but unfortunately for the government, that's how you go about looking for openings. And I know we kind of have a series of rotating openings. So consider giving us a look if you're interested in that bigger picture application. 
So that being said, that's how I'm going to be approaching um, copper and then the future of copper and then the exploration for it. We have two other speakers who are far more boots on the ground and will get down to the deposit level side of things. Whereas um, my center and my expertise is more tracking the general health of these commodities. What are the patterns and trends that we see and what are risks we kind of see maybe in the decadal scale, not in the daily market trading scale. So to kind of start that off, we, you know, we want to track production because the mining industry is relatively slow to change. So what's happened in the past is probably going to be pretty indicative of what's happened in the uh, short term uh, future to come. And so when we look at things like mine production of copper, what we've seen is, you know, production's been increasing in recent years, but it's been heavily dominated by South, um, South America, Chile, and Peru in particular. But we've seen new entrants. So in particular, DRC, which we have a speaker um, really digging into, uh, as well as Poland, um, they've been kind of increasing that kind of diverse supply. Whereas when we look at the actual processing of copper and the smelting and the refining, we've seen China have a very increased uh, share of that material. And so one of the ways we kind of turn this into a metric, right, because you're not always comparing apples to apples, is we use something called an HHI. And so an HHI, it's something that uh, Department of Justice uses to say if, you know, an industry is in a monopoly. But what that does is we are comparing the market share of an industry and their participants. And so a high HHI means it's very concentrated. A low HHI means it's relatively diffuse. There's lots of participants and it's, you know, well spread out market. And so what we've seen in recent decades is the HHI of mine production has been decreasing. And that's because we've had more and more countries coming online and producing. And so it's diversifying the total supply. But we've seen concurrent to that though is the refined copper products those are becoming much more um, concentrated and that's really reflecting that share of the refined production coming out of china and so what's driving that refinery production though interestingly enough is it's actually imports from the rest of the world um, so material from places like chile are going to china to then be turned into shiny metal now you know in terms of mine production why is mine production located where it is well obviously, as you're probably expecting, it's geologically derived. And what we kind of see when we look at the, um, the deposits that are contributing to mine production over time, what you see is world copper is heavily influenced by porphyry deposits. They're easily 50% or more of global production. And then you have things like sediment hosted as the next largest, but you're now then kind of eating at the margins. And so that's where it's gonna be very important when we look towards things like exploration, because what you have are these very high tonnage porphyry deposits that are really contributing to the total copper resources in the world versus you, know, you can find a VMS deposit but it's only going to be nibbling at the edges of the world resources. Whereas if you find one of these super massive porphyry deposits, you've had changed basically the outlook for a while on copper. Um, and there's a great kind of statistic uh, Singer had put together where 20% of world copper deposits are hosting 92% of world copper. And so that perspective is really kind of important to keep in mind because you're looking at a very poorly distributed uh, um, set of deposits. But right. We're, we're caring about the future, so how are we going to get there? Um, and so one of the things we want to do is we look at apparent consumption. So apparent consumption is basically how much you've produced plus how much you've imported. Um, it's kind We use it as a proxy for demand because demand for every country on earth on an annual basis is relatively hard to come by. So it's a decent proxy, but what you've seen over the past 20 years is China's gone from basically being a participant in terms of refined copper consumption to being more than 50% of global copper consumption. And then their next largest population competitor, India, is a very thin uh, sliver of that. And so that's something to keep in mind is one country is heavily influencing that. But okay, that consumption is increasing. Does it increase forever? What's the, the outlook for that? And so one of the things that we've noticed, it's a cool trend that you see across multiple commodities, is if we take that apparent consumption and we do it per capita, um, so it's you know per person per year, how much copper they're consuming, and then we compare that with GDP per capita, um, what you see is during the economic maturation of a country, you have this very linear ramp up period where there's more and more copper being consumed because you're putting it into building and economic development. But at a certain point, as you become economically developed, you basically saturate and you plateau. And so there's basically a boundary, you know, between in copper's case, between 12 and 8 kilograms per person per year, where, you know, demand is basically flatlined. And so the reason for that, and again, you see this in cement, you see this in steel. What's happening is in the early stage of development, you're building lots of construction, infrastructure, things like that. So you need lots and lots 
of that material during the ramp up stage. But once you've built a lot of that infrastructure, you're not really adding to it as much. You're now just kind of maintaining and replacing it. And so as you move to mature economies, you basically are stabilizing demand. Now that's great. It means, you know, on a per person basis, we're not going to be consuming at infinitum, but that's per person. Global population is increasing. So what's the cumulative sense? And the one thing we have going for us is in the next 100 years or so, global population is expected to peak. And so that paces an upper limit on where you could expect copper consumption overall to be going. But again, that's kind of hand wavy and that's in you know the 100 to 100 plus years scenario. What we really care right is about the more applicable and relevant future. And so there's lots of people who've been doing copper demand scenarios and demand models. Um, Wittari did this great projection where they looked at 72 different copper demand models. And what they find is there's basically a midpoint by about 2100 where we're expecting demand to be on the order of maybe 100 million tons per year, um, which is okay. What does that actually mean? What's that look like? What's the breakout? That's where um, I think this is a really um, helpful graph because what it's looking at is by end use sector where that copper is going. And so similar to that economic development ramp up, what you're seeing is building uh, construction and then infrastructure energy generation. That's what's driving the future copper demand. And what's also really important and something that's one of the themes of not only this, but I know SEG's big coming of meeting, um, this wedge under the dashed line is the green energy generation uh, component. And that's gonna be the real wild card for the future of copper demand, because depending on your renewable portfolio, Green energy can consume up to maybe double the amount of the copper that's going into the current energy portfolio. So that's really one of the big scenarios that kind of changes that um, changes the bar for copper demand, but we really don't know what's going to be playing out to the future. So that's the one thing to kind of keep in mind between you know, policymakers and just even as markets are driving this, um, what is going to be the copper intensity in that infrastructure but still infrastructure and construction, that's what's going, where copper is going to be spoken for moving into the future, not so much say consumer demand. Now, what's also important to note though is that's copper demand just total. We're very good at recycling copper, so that's included in that. So what we really wanna know is how much primary copper do we need? The, the new metal that we have to pull out of the ground. Um, and so Shippergold did this really kind of cool graph where it's cumulative primary copper demand. So it's just adding year on year on year on year to the total. Um, and it's for uh, various consumption scenarios, but also uh, re certain recycling scenarios. So the hard lines are um, a lower recycling scenario, 70%. Dash lines are a high recycling scenario, 90%. But what's important is, okay, they projected the identified resources of copper on that line. And what they were showing is, you know, based on the worst case kind of scenario for copper primary demand, you intersect the identified resources by about 2070 at the earliest. So, okay, A, that's far in the future, but this is where people kind of run into trouble as they're looking at the, the future for these things is, oh no, that means that we're out of copper by 2070. But no, those identified resources are just as of that moment. And that's the important thing to keep in mind. One of the things we see where people will try to make a headline or whatnot is they'll take the, the reserves numbers um, that you might see for any commodity really, and then they divide that by the product, annual production. And then you say, oh, we're 40 years out from running out of copper. Yes, but if you look at annual ratios of reserve to production, we've been 40 years away from running out of copper for the past 20 years. The reason is we're constantly doing exploration. We're constantly turning resources into reserves. So you really shouldn't use those metrics as the fixed in stone point. What you really want to be looking at are what are cumulative expected resources. And so again, Singer had kind of done this where they were looking at, you know, copper, all of copper that's been produced through all of human history, all of the known copper resources that are out there. So they have about 2 billion tons, which is what um, in that previous slide where they intersected at about for projected demand around 2070 at the earliest. Okay, that is spoken for, but we know that we're gonna be continuously doing new exploration. And so you have this much larger bar, which are these undiscovered um, resource estimates. And so this is where you really have to keep in mind the future of a lot of these commodities. Um, there's very smart folks at the resource, pro the mineral resource program at the USGS who do these undiscovered resources where they take areas they call permissive tracks where there's known deposits, there's favorable chemistry, there's favorable depositional environments, and they do a bunch of fancy statistics to say, hey, we have a high confidence, um, a high confidence that there is certain amount of copper resources in this tract 
and they can compare that to then the identified resources. And so you have an identified number and then an expected to be their undiscovered number. And so if we look at the two major copper deposits uh, that are feeding copper production, what you see is for North and South America, there's almost as much projected undiscovered resources as there are identified. You get to places like Asia, there's a lot more undiscovered uh, likely out there than what we found so far. And I know we have speakers who are experts in Africa and the Middle East, particularly Central African copper belts. Well, it looks like there's probably at least as much copper in those regions uh, to be found as we found so far. So that should be good, right? There are huge copper inventories likely out there, but the trick is, well, we need to actually find them, identify them, and eventually turn them into reserves that we can put a mine on. And so this is one of the trends that's, if you were to say what makes people kind of nervous in recent years, we know there's lots of copper out there, but as we've been doing a lot of exploration, we're adding only smaller and smaller uh, additions to the total resource and reserve pile. Um, and so, yeah, we've had a little bit of an uptick in exploration budgets, but even then, when we look at the cumulative uh, mass of copper being added in these major discoveries, it's nibbling at the edges. And so it makes sense that there's lots of exploration budgets going on in places like Latin America, because if you think back to where I showed those resources by deposit type, Latin America is sitting on some of the largest porphyry deposits we know of already. We know they're very favorable permissive tracks. And if you look in the past, all it takes is finding, you know, one Escondida, um, one Las Bombas, and you've already added a huge chunk to the copper resource base. So that's a bit of a hurdle that's, it's a quirk, right? That we know that there's more material out there. We're just not sticking a pin in it yet. And so exploration has to obviously kind of continue in earnest to make sure um, that, you know, for those times out in the future that we are converting resources and expected resources into no identified resources and then reserves. But they're out there. It's just, there, there's a challenge in doing that. In addition to that though, explorations and resource development, yeah, that's really important to know that there is a ton of copper out there. We need to know exactly where that copper is out there, but we also need to put a mine on it. And that's one of the most important short-term challenges um, that we're kind of seeing is that mine capacity um, might not be keeping up with this in recent years, as we come out of the pandemic, as there's been a bunch of new energy uh, policies that are gonna be very copper intensive, what we've seen is the expected copper demand in the short term has really been ramping up faster than the, the supply growth has. And so that's where there's basically, you'll see headlines where they're talking about shortfalls, gaps, shortages. But what's important to note is it's disequilibrium between supply and demand usually just results in say a price increase, or if we look at let's say the London metal exchange stockpiles, people have been dipping into those stockpiles, but it doesn't mean we're running out of copper in the, in the real sense. What it just means is, okay, industry is going to have to, you know, you, you can't really run mines at hundred percent capacity for very long, but it's going to be a matter of, okay, can we add more capacity? Can we add more mines? And the one thing is when we have those disequilibrium events, prices go up, it means there's more money for exploration, there's more money to go into trying to build new mines, and mines that maybe were sub-economic might come on and now be considered a, you know, a viable property. And so from our house, when we look at things, again, I said, you know, Nimic, we're looking at the long-term health and trends. We're not playing the market going day by day. This is a trend that we see in multiple commodities over very long scales that, yep, the supply and demand aren't always perfectly traveling in harmony. Prices kind of fluctuate, but they then drive, you know, the next cycle of exploration and new mine development. So it's not catastrophic in the sense of, oh, no, we're running out, but it does mean that, okay, if I'm a, you know, a producer or a manufacturer, okay, copper's going to get expensive until the stuff comes online. Those are the things to kind of keep in mind in terms of, you know, economic health. Um, and then to kind of wrap this up from, from my part is how we're looking at those trends, again, Copper, as it makes sense, mine production is very geologically dependent. So, you know, the hot spots for copper are probably going to continue to be the places that we've seen copper production in the past. Central Africa, South America, the American Cordillera. Um, those are, you know, where action's probably likely to continue because they're very permissive tracks. Um, as we look to future demand longer than just, you know, the next five years, what we're really seeing as, as global economic uh, maturity is occurring, that we're really gonna be driven by infrastructure and construction growth. And then there's this added wild card of, well, what is the renewable energy scenario um, that 
we're going to encounter going forward. That's what's going to put the wiggle room on copper. But again, it's installing all of those, all that um, infrastructure capacity. That's where copper is going to be going for likely the next century. But it will taper off into the future um, and stabilize. Now, yes, there's potential for those short-term supply shortfalls, the disequilibrium. And I'm guessing, again, the people on the much more daily exploration side, that's something they're probably far more concerned with than when we are looking at the, the overall health. But we know there is enough copper out there. It's not a critical there's not that material. It's just, okay, can we get that material and um, you know, not be hurting through prices? That being said, there are challenges that mines are going to be facing in the future. One of the ones that we like to talk about is that when we look commodity, uh, not just for copper, but lots of commodities, the ore grades that we've been mining have been decreasing over the past several decades. And so what that means is as we move to the future, you're basically going to have to start adopting the Walmart model of basically getting lower and lower grade, lower and lower um, returns and mine higher and higher tonnages to try to not only meet the current uh, demand, but you know, as we move towards the future. And so that's gonna raise the question of, do we need to start adapting mining techniques? And that's where there's really the call for not only the economic geologists, but also um, the minerals processing folks, the mining engineers, how can we make sure that we're getting as much or more copper from lower and lower quality deposits? Those are the things that the, the challenges that we should really be kind of worrying about towards the future, not necessarily, um, you know, worrying over what's happening in the next, you know, the, the dollar amount. So uh, I hope that uh, sets up um, the next couple of speakers, and I hope um, it, it's an interesting con uh, context for discussion. Copper is a really interesting commodity, um, and, and again, I thank SEG for the opportunity to kind of talk about our perspective with that. So thank you, Bob. Thank you, Jimmy. I think that there are four really good questions in the chat that you're free to type answers to or save them for the Q&A discussion because I think that they're going to be very valuable for, for our other panelists as well. Okay, so next up is George Gilchrist. George studied geology at the University of the Witwatersrand in South America or South Africa, and has worked in the mining industry for over, over 20 years. Uh, he specializes in understanding the geological controls on mineralization and building these controls into geological and resource models used in exploration, mining studies, and production environments. He has worked for Ivanhoe Mines for the last 10 years across their platinum group element zinc and copper projects and was heavily involved in the discovery, delineation and modeling of the Kukula de copper deposit in the DRC. George lived and worked in both South Africa and Canada with projects focused on gold, silver, platinum, copper and nickel deposits across a range of different geological and geographical settings, including Southern and West Africa, South America, North America and Russia. With that, I'll let George take it away. Thank you. Can you see that, Lauren? Yes, I can. Perfect. All right, excellent. All right, so I'm going to be speaking in the context of uh, stratiform copper deposits, uh, in particular, the Kamoa Kakula deposit in the Central African Copper Belt, a fairly recent um, discovery uh, and a very significant one. And this, I think this picture. I've shown this before, but it kind of highlights its color is very deceptive in geology, but the Kukula, it's actually very indicative of grade. Uh, and the darker the color, the higher the grade. And when your deposit starts to resemble a coal seam, then you know you're into some really, really impressive grades. Uh, so that dark material will be running at 10% copper uh, and we'll be doing that over large areas. Uh, it's an absolutely amazing deposit. So just a bit about me. Um, so Lauren gave my, my background. Uh, I started on the gold mines in South Africa, a very common place for South African geologists, um, certainly 20 years ago. I had the unenviable distinction of being the deepest working geologist in the world, 3,600 meters below surface, uh, very cramped, very hot, very dangerous, um, but it was hard work, but it taught me a lot uh, and it was a good foundation. I joined Snowden did consulting across a variety of uh, environments. That picture is, is me in a 
an adit in far northern Russia where everything was just covered in nice crystals. Absolutely spectacular. <laughs> From a, you know, you're used to getting into dirty mines and you walk into that, it's just stunning. Uh, so I have had amazing opportunities to see different deposits. Uh, and then I've really got my teeth stuck into the Ivano projects over the last 10 years. Uh, so it's been a combination of broad experience and then real detail. So I want to focus on a few aspects of geology uh, when it comes to exploration. Uh, here's some pictures from the copper belt. There's Kapushi up the top uh, and in Changa. And if you look at the the writing at the bottom left of that photograph, a Rhodesian copper mine. Uh, so if you know your history, Rhodesia ceased many, many years ago. Uh, it's now Zambia, uh, certainly northern Rhodesia. And that mine has been operational for decades. So it's Kapushi, long life, long asset, you know, huge uh, amounts of metal. And the, the copper belt is known for this, but it's deposits that have been known about for a very long time and have either been mined over decades or at least known and only more recently developed. Uh, but that map from 1981, you would consider the copper belt to have been a fairly mature environment for exploration. And uh, you might have heard a lot of people saying that the easy deposits have been found um, and now the harder ones lie ahead. And that's maybe good in that it's challenging that we have to really apply ourselves to find them. But a bit depressing, and that you know, finding an easy one is quite nice sometimes. Uh, the message from here is there are a few very impressive deposits that aren't on this map, uh, and what was thought to be a very mature environment is actually anything but. Uh, and that's very, very encouraging. And they're not super difficult deposits; they just require a change of thinking. So, the key ingredients. So. We can look at deposits on a, you know, how do you form a copper belt? Uh, what are the ingredients necessary for that? What I'm looking at here is more what are the ingredients you need to form the deposits? Um, so I'm looking at a slightly smaller scale. Um, so you need a metal source. You know, this is not difficult to understand, but you need to get the metal to derive it from somewhere, large volumes of sediment in this case. You need an aquifer that you can move it through. You need to be able to focus those fluids. And then you need to have a reducing element in the stratigraphy that that fluid can interact with and precipitate the copper. And so if you've watched Notting Hill, I just adapted a, a quote there. I'm just a reductant close to an aquifer asking him to love her. All right, that's, that's in simple terms what, uh, what's needed. So Kamoka Kula, the reason I'm highlighting these is that Kamoka Kula was found in an area that was thought to be unprospective or certainly had never attracted the kind of attention that it really deserves. Uh, and that was simply because the ingredients that people were looking at were different. They were looking for the correct unit in the stratigraphy, which isn't one of the ingredients for forming deposits. Uh, it's not that strata bound um, on, a, on a broad scale. And the Kamoa Kakula discovery today uh, is now one of the biggest copper deposits uh, in the world. Uh, it's in production, it's being ramped up, producing a lot of copper uh, and at feed grades in excess of 5% currently. Uh, so incredibly high grade. Um, so are grades dropping because that's all that's left or are grades dropping because people have been focused on porphyries for so long that they've lost sight of some really high grade um, exploration ground to, to explore. So this is a picture in 2004. Now that map doesn't look too dissimilar from the one I showed from 1981. Uh, a lot of deposits over hundreds of kilometers, but the same deposits that were known about uh, in the 80s uh, with one or two exceptions. But generally the big ones, uh, Nchanga, Kunkola, um, coming up into the DLC, Tenkafungurumi, Kolwezi, really big, impressive deposits. And all hosted very appropriately within the mines group. Um, now, where the mines group has failed to develop, people have moved away and said, well, we're, we're not in the right place. Uh, and Ivanhoe then said, well, let's pick up all the ground around the edges where the mines group isn't necessarily developed, but look at whether mineralizing systems are working on a bigger scale. Obviously they're working on a huge scale here. Uh, so if 
the ideal stratigraphy isn't there, maybe other units um, could become prospective. And so zooming into Kamoa Kakula, there's that red dashed line, which is a interpreted detachment. And that sort of marked the boundary between what was considered all the prospective ground to the east. And if you cross that boundary, you suddenly move much higher up in the stratigraphy and you are believed to be, you know, either deposits were really deep or they're not, de not developed. Uh, and so people didn't focus the exploration there. But of course, the fluid is not worried about that. It's looking for the first reductant it can interact with. And if your classic reductant isn't developed, it will move until it finds the next reductant, which is where Kamo and Kakula are located. So we zoom in a little bit more into the discovery section of Kamoa. You'll see drilling, there was a lot of soil sampling, a lot of um, air core drilling initially. Uh, and then this dis discovery section was put in place. And the first hole intersected six meters at 3.3%, which is a fantastic way to start uh, a diamond drill program. And then progressive step outs encountered very similar characteristics, similar grade, uh, and not in the complex environment uh, that it, the DLC is known for, not in the salt tectonic environment, in a much more gently folded um, deposit. And as drilling expanded, uh, the scale of Kamoa became apparent. And then a few years later, drilling continued to the south and picked up Kakula. And so this is a real encouragement, I hope, um, to people who are maybe starting an industry or fairly new, wondering if there's something special there to be discovered. Um, this has been an absolute special discovery uh, and it's had a huge impact in filling some of that supply gap uh, that's coming over the next few years. So one of the things I wanted to focus on in, in this um, talk is just to think about why Kukula wasn't known about earlier and how we can prevent that happening. And so in psychology, you get something called cognitive dissonance where the perception of contradictory information has a mental toll to it in that when we hold something that we believe to be true, anything that supports that, we are very happy to accept. Anything that doesn't support it, we'll very strongly oppose and be very critical of that information. Uh, that's human nature. Uh, and that will affect your exploration. When you develop an exploration model, any evidence that supports that model is very eagerly accepted. And any evidence that shows that model is wrong uh, might be more sort of quietly ignored. And of course, that means that you become blinkered in your exploration and you don't find the deposits that are there waiting to be discovered. Uh, so being willing to constantly test your ideas and be flexible and open to what the data is telling you is really, really important. So I'll give you some examples and I'm going to bounce through a couple of things, but just to show you this in context at Kamoa. So Kamoa itself was discovered because people used a different way of thinking, but even Kamoa shows a huge amount of variety and variability, uh, and you cannot easily characterize certain things. So here's an example. This is the lowermost diamectite unit. If you said, well, this diamectite unit is 20 to 30 meters thick, you know, that, that only really applies in a few small areas. The thickness is constantly changing across the deposit. So maybe it would be better to say, well, the diamectite unit is consistently thickening to the southwest. Right? And that You can see it's not really consistent. It's happening over sharper changes. This is a rift environment, but that would be a fair way of characterizing it. Then the next unit up is a siltstone unit, a very pyritic siltstone unit. That shows similar trends, except the thickness changes are happening on the same sort of structures, but it's not consistently thickening to the Southwest. So now you can't stick to any model that says all units are consistently thickening to the Southwest. You have to realize that you're in a very dynamic depositional environment, uh, things are changing and you need to be flexible to that in how you define units, in how you identify and, and correlate units. So there's some structures controlling the sedimentation. These are really, really important as I'll highlight now. Their structures controlling sedimentation in that unit. And unsurprisingly, they are very similar in their distribution and their, their geometry. Because this is a rift environment where existing structures will be reactivated over time. Uh, and that's very important. That's one of your key ingredients is the ability to focus fluid 
uh, and the structures are also forming the right depositional environment for your reductants. So really, really critical. So if I zoom in on the, the siltstone units and you see there those um, structures, I've shown this in previous talks, you take that away, you put the grade distribution on and you put the structures back on and you can see a very strong correlation. So the grade is definitely being controlled by your rift geometry. So understanding that geometry and understanding the broad controls uh, is key to looking for these deposits. Okay, something else. Um, this is just a very quick little section through one part of uh, Kakula. The top that the yellow unit is the very pyrite rich siltstone I showed earlier. You can see over just a few hundred meters how this unit can change in thickness. Now here, the dimectite above has actually reworked large portions of the siltstone and incorporated it. So you get a very silty pyritic dimectite compared to far more class rich dimectites in other areas. So you can see a very dynamic process. There's a siltstone at the base that is absent over almost all of the property. And then just in the Southwest, it suddenly opens up and develops into quite a well-developed um, sequence, which can be a siltstone, but it can be a conglomerate sandstone, very variable over short distances. And this is an example of a unit that actually created a bit of confusion. So if I show you some photographs, you'll see one part of this unit is a very sandy unit overlain by uh, maybe a very narrow saltstone and then into the dimectite. Not too far on from that, you're getting a saltstone, uh, sorry, sandstone with some salt units and then a very pyritic saltstone. And pyritic saltstones at Kamoa are very distinctive. We have two very well developed ones. Uh, and so this created confusion because the thinking had become blinkered uh, in how we were identifying and correlating units. So when you intersect a pyritic siltstone, it becomes the 112, you intersect another one, oh, then you relog the first one as the 114, and the second one must be the 112. When you intersect a third one, in this case, now there's confusion, because there's only supposed to be two, right? So there's a clear example of how the thinking is becoming, you're characterizing things because it's very easy and it becomes very comfortable to log when you know there are only two of these things available. Instead of saying, if the depositional environment is correct, you will form these type of deposits. It doesn't matter how many you're gonna get in the sequence. The footwall controls, the aquifer, it's highly variable too. It's usually a coarse sandstone, but it can be a conglomerate. Sometimes it can be a siltstone because it's also part of the rifting sequence and it has its own complexities relating to the rift environment. Mineralization is largely stratiform and it's predictable in its changes, but it does move from one unit to another. You can find mineralization in different units. And you'll see that as this lower diamond type pinches out, your reductant gets closer and closer to the aquifer and your grades improve and you get your best consistently mineralized areas where it's close to the aquifer, where your controls are working. So, even on the scale of Kamoa Kakula and the regional exploration, we're finding mineralized zones in different parts of the basin being hosted in subtly different positions with different controls at play. So I can't give you one specific characterization of mineralization at Kamoa Kakula. It varies because the dynamic and the environment is so, so variable. So Kakula is in the deep part of the basin right on the aquifer. Other parts are much closer up where your aquifer is actually pinching out onto the basement. And then you get some very structurally controlled mineralization. So here's an example of your sort of typical diamectite hosted mineralization. And then a structure that's allowed your mineralizing fluid to bypass the diamectite and gain direct access to one of the best reductants on the property. And then your grades go crazy. So we're getting grades of over 20, <clears throat> 20 to 30% in this zone, but it's a very specific style of mineralization. So it's hard to characterize things and box things. And that's, that's the message. So just quickly, well, what are these regional controls? This is an image from Selly and, and others uh, in 2018, which really highlights key structures, in this case, in the Northern part of the, the Copper Belt, 
but you'll notice all of the big deposits are sitting on these big regional scale structures, including Kukula and including discoveries we've made further west of Kukula. So these big scale structures in your rift are your key controls um, in your mineralization. Keep these as your key focus and be flexible on your other characteristics. When you go west from these, this is Kukula on the left, uh, very high grade mineralization in the siltstone and Makoko, which is a discovery we've made west of that in, in a different unit. This is not the same siltstone. It's a completely different part of the stratigraphy, but it's in the right position and it mineralizes in the same way and gives you the same profile and, and types of grades that we're seeing. So if we look at the copper belt, we've added some really big circles here in the west. Uh, and I don't think we've seen the end of these big circles coming into the copper belt as people's uh, view of prospectivity has expanded following these discoveries. Um, so just to conclude, Geology is a study of complex processes that are not easily characterized. Constantly test your assumptions. Uh, make sure you focus on the key controls and allow yourself to be flexible on the others. And you're in the context of Kamoa and the Copper Belts, the rift architecture is your really important um, understanding. So thanks. Well, thanks, George. I think that was really interesting and I'm excited to see kind of what Helen has to say following up on that, because that's a great overview of Kamo Kakula, and I know that Helen's going to speak to the current research that's being done. So with that, let's pull up Helen's. There we go, it took me a minute. All right, so Helen Twig from IPRAG. Helen studied geology at the University of Leeds and received an MSc in geology from Colorado School of Mines. She has worked in exploration for over 15 years, searching for orogenic gold in Western and Central Africa and sedimentary hosted copper, cobalt, and nickel in the Central African Copper Belt. Her industry experience spans all exploration stages from greenfields to pre-production modeling with junior exploration companies and mid-tier mining companies. Helen is a PhD candidate in the Science Foundation Ireland Research Center in Applied Geology, or ICRAG, at University College Dublin. She studies basin development and the processes which control sedimentary hosted base metal mineralization. Her research integrates exploration, geophysical and geochemical data sets with petrological and field observational work. The project investigates structural and geochemical vectors to copper zinc in the underexplored Southern Congolese copper belt, copper belt. And I will let you, let me see if I pull it up real quick. Um, it's sharing your- There we go, I figured it out. Okay, go for it. Let's see. Right, can you see that yet? Oh no, hold on. Okay, I see not the presentation. There we go. Okay, all right, perfect. Okay, um, I think I may turn off my uh, video because my internet has been a bit jumpy today. So you'll just have to focus very much on the screen, which is great for me. Okay, right. So um, I'm Helen Twig, a PhD student at the University College Dublin. So I'm a member of the Central African Copper Belt Research Group in um, the ICRAG Research Centre. Um, and I'm going to talk to you today about exploration oriented research project that I've been involved in for the last couple of years. I'm approaching a similar problem um, as George, but from a very different view. So I'm definitely on the exploration side and I've got very little drill hole data. And it's just a slight, it's, it's exactly the same problems, even though I'm looking at um, more vein hosted orogenic copper. Um, much later stage mineralization, but it's still still the same issues are in your head. 
Okay. Oh, move. Right. Okay. Right. So um, I'm from UK, from the Midlands, and I did my undergrad geology at Leeds, and I went straight into exploration. So I got offered a job in Sierra Leone doing gold exploration, um, mostly because I worked on a farm, it turned out, and I thought I'd be tough. Um, and so I worked in West Africa in early stage greenfields work. Um, and then moved on to kind of bankable key stability study in there. After a while, I got a little bit bored and moved on to the Central African, um, sorry, the Democratic Republic of Congo, the Central African Copper Belt, and I seem to have got stuck there, um, even though I'm kind of at the universities at the moment. Um, so I recently um, been working on um, the halokinetic structures in the southern Congolese belt after working more in the uh, the stratiform mineralization in the uh, um, the central Congolese copper belts. Like that. Okay, so I'm really interested in integrating multidisciplinary data um, from geochemistry and geophysics with kind of doing lithostratigraphic interpretations of the basin and then after that then I really get into the alteration and the mineralization because I really need to understand kind of what's going on in a kind of basin development and basin inversion before I get too much bogged down into the mineralization because the mineralization the alteration can very much kind of destroy everything make it really difficult to understand so um I initially started working in Kikanda, which has got the red star on the map on the left hand side. Um, and after working in a very large drilling program on um, drilling at resources and doing some brownfield and greenfield exploration, I started getting a little bit uh, frustrated actually with the, the very unusual geology that we were coming on across. Um, so we were finding um, hydrothermal nickel. We were finding um, a kyanite in veins with chalcopyrite, and it was it was surprising. And there was very little trends that we could see with the copper and the cobalt that kind of made any sense. This is when I actually went back to university and decided to do a master's trying to understand the copper cobalt sulfide trends in the central African copper belt. And then I moved on to the southern Congolese copper belts, but in a small area that actually sticks into Zambia, because we had some wonderful um, geophysics airborne mag surveys and lovely uh, geochemical data that we could actually work on and try and actually understand what was going on in a large kind of district area that's kind of 50 by 50 kilometers. Okay. So what the Southern Congolese copper belts is little explored, much less explored than the rest of the copper belt. So you can see in the map on the left hand side, all those kind of bright green dots of the deposits in the, the central Congolese copper belt, the northern Congolese copper belt. So these are these classical um, early stratiform hosted, but not stratiband, um, copper cobalt mineralization. And then down in the kind of bottom right corner you've got the dark greens which is the classical Zambian stratiform copper mineralization and then a lot which has been historically mined for a long period of time and then there was always these known um, zinc lead copper kind of mineralization events and deposits so the Kukushi mine which is basically right by my study area and then two small mineralization events so Lombi and and I agree. Um, and very little, it's not, and the area is not particularly well mapped. Um, and it's not really been on many people's radar for a significant amount of exploration. Um, the domes region opened up over the last decade or a bit more um, with um, the the discoveries of enterprise and fentanyl and consumption. So there's a lot of exploration activity in there, but again, there's still a lot to be found. 
So these are probably maybe some of the places we're gonna kind of hopefully come online with the demand that's needed coming up. Okay. So not only is the potential for zinc and lead in the southern companies to talk about, but also um, as I talk through it, there's potential for um, some orogenic associated fracture vein mineralization that would have happened during basin inversion. Okay. So my research is a collaboration between University College Dublin, ICRAG, and Rio Tinto and First Quantum. We're very lucky that these companies have got together and allowed me to, to use both their data to cover quite a wide area, okay? We've also um, had assistance from Cobalt, um, who have provided some, have found some good historical data. Um, our academic research partners, where we've actually done um, uh, SEM, EDX mapping, geochronology, CL tetralogy and transmission microscopy have been at Trinity College, the Natural History Museum of Anne Colorado School of Mines. And my research is, is funded predominantly by Science Foundation Island and with some additional help from the industry partners, okay? And my work has really been helped along by a bunch of additional companies allowing me to come and look at some old historical core that they have that's pertinent to my research. And I, I do appreciate that. So that was KCM, ZCCM, and Ivanhoe. Okay. Um, okay. So George has already talked a little bit about the Central African Copper Belt. So we outlined where the Kamoa Kukula deposit is. And we're using slightly different names to separate out the belt than on, on his map. So this is more, this separates the belt based on the tectonic deformation from the basin inversion, but also a little bit on where there may be some underlying basin architecture differences, okay, throughout the belt. It could be controlling the zoning of the mineralization, definitely the styles of the alteration. And, um, yeah, what this base, base metal zoning that we see across it from the copper cobalt in the northern and central Congolese copper belt to the slightly older uranium nickel um, and with cobalt around the middle with the yellow dots there and then with the, the zinc copper lead mineralization in the southern Congolese copper belt. Okay. Uh, and one of the things that I'm doing as I'm looking at the stratigraphy and I'm trying to work out what's going on across the belt. Okay, not a, the entire belt, but what's the difference between the Southern Congolese copper belt and the rest of the Central Congolese copper belt. Okay. So ICRAG is, uh, has got quite a, a big sedimentary basin focus. So not only do we have, um, the Central African Copper Belt. But before uh, this research group started, we had the Irish Oil Fields Research Group and a Fault Analysis Research Group as well, kind of working on, now on CCS, but before working on petroleum. Um, and we've also got quite a good um, academia industry mix. So within the Central Co African Copper Research uh, team, we've got uh, six to eight projects going on at the moment across the area. So we've got the three postdocs at the top. So we've got Anna who's working, she's a metamorphic geologist by trade, uh, which is great. So she's working to characterize the kyanite associations we've got in the copper belt, because we have a lot of these uh, oddities where we've got minerals where we would not expect them to be um, based on current uh, models of their behavior. And she's also working on the thermodynamic modeling of perlite and cobalt types, which is fantastic. Um, but Subaru, who just finished up his research looking at the geology geochemistry of um, fish tie down in the Masali Basin. But Aileen, who's working on the strictly geochemistry and mineralization of the Bombay. Victor is working with her on, on a separate project. Um, and he's looking at the nature and the timing of the ore mineralization and alteration, and also the basin configuration there. Um, and we've got 
Malena, who's working on a, a wider scale, um, look at how, where the cobalt is distributed, the high grade cobalt, and a little bit where it is and what are the controls. Okay. Um, Alleluia is working on the Rosh Pina, so not quite the Congolese copper belt, but we like to try and tell her that she's with us. Okay. Um, and then myself working in this uh, Greater Kalindi area in Zambia that I'll keep telling you it's the Southern Congolese copper belt. Okay. So the data that we have, when I try and do a larger scale research project, I need to integrate all of the exploration data that we have with any other information that I have available. And there's not a lot in this area. So the historical data is limited to kind of in, within this kind of blue box, which is around the Kafushi anticline because it's near the Kafushi zinc lead copper mine. Okay, so it was very interesting for exploration. Um, so um, we, the study is a large scale of most, it's about 50 by 50 kilometers. And I start by integrating historical data with the magnetic airborne surveys and the soil geochemistries. So the first start for me is the magnetic data. I treat it like it's a seismic data set and I pick um, horizons along it, um, mostly looking at unconformities and starting from where I have a known kind of start of the stratigraphy from the historical data and I can work my way kind of up section. I create like a fake stratigraphy because I don't know exactly where it is at this stage. Um, and then I start kind of integrating the historical data and the original maps, and especially in an area where I have good data. So within that historical data box, and I can start looking at what the characteristics are. Okay. And so I would create a kind of a, a, a stratigraphic column for the area from where the data is available. Okay, so I've got, I'm lucky, I've got a fairly good data set around Kapushi with the historical drill holes and the exploration drill holes from Rio and First Quantum. Um, so I would create, do a description of the stratigraphy. I compile all of the drill holes together. Um, so I have a composite section and I look at the geochemical characteristics of the, the, the stratigraphy and how it weathers in the drill hole, because I have multiple element geochemistry all the way through the drill hole. And I can start actually then manipulating the soil geochemistry multi-element data set, and I can start mapping with that, okay? So I can start to pick out kind of what's kind of carbonates, what's siliciclastic, have I got any kind of geochemical mark horizons in the siliciclastics? And I can look at the um, any indicators of um, provenance as well. And this helps with the interpretation. And I start to merge that with the magnetic strap data. So the contacts come from the magnetics, but the actual lithology and the stratigraphic positions, I kind of drag across from the historic from all of the areas where I've got good mapping, and I can drag it across the area. And I managed to drag it kind of 20, 30 kilometers across from the Kapushi anticline. And I dragged the Congolese geology right into the into Zambia. Okay. And as you and this work takes quite a lot of reiterations, it's it's quite annoying. Um, and but eventually you can start pulling out, you can work out what elements are associated with plays um, and you can even start getting indications of, of grain size and eventually if you start looking for redox horizons and maybe fasces changes within this then maybe you can if you're looking at um, organophilic elements then you can start pulling out maybe where we have reduced horizons in here okay so I just want to say quickly um, that actually, I'll go to the next one. Yes, these pink colours in here um, on the, the airborne geophysics map on the, the left hand side, these are interpreted, interpreted fractures, which are 
after the evaporites. Okay, so they're, they're the rowan brush if you're familiar with the area. Okay, um, so they are characterized by pretty chaotic magnetic signature and also a very chaotic geochemical signature when we're looking at this kind of remote data. Um, so one of the things that is important for kind of basin interpretation is to really pick out unconformity bound packages because these unconformities will tell you, you know, how the basin was developing and changing. Okay, and what you can notice is where those two big red circles are is where we've got a lot of um, packages pinching together and actually onlapping onto the edge of these rowing bracture bodies. Um, and the style of these pinching and onlapping um, stratigraphic packages is very much similar to what you get in mini basins in the Gulf of Mexico. Okay, so the uh, Rowan Breccia here is interpreted as having two diapirs um, where we got the red circles um, and the actual main part of the anticline in there, uh, which See in this figure actually, which we'll have to come back to, but that'll be just the squeezed foot wall in the middle. Um, but I'll come back to that. Okay, so the soil geochemistry um, was based on the interpretation that Halley um, published in the SED newsletter uh, back in 2016. So it's a manual classification method. Okay, so we can match the provenance signature in the soil geochemistry with what you can see in multi element geochemistry with the core, which is very, which is great. Um, and it means that you can actually really map your entire area. Um, and I've already talked through the other bits, but um, yeah, I found that some of the key, key elements for mapping out kind of the fine green, fine grained um, fasces was kind of high, it was high in vanadium, high in chrome. Um, and then the organic, vanadium is sometimes used to indicate organophilic, but yeah, here I found it most likely indicated just to find grain size. And really it was where we have uh, some other organophilic elements like the zinc that actually really picked out where the reduced horizons were. Um, and then, so going on beyond this, because this is several years out of date now, the next stage is really to integrate all this data with machine learning and data analytics. And I'm going to be collaborating on a project soon to do that. So I'm very excited about that. Um, so I've already told you that I, I created a, a stratigraphy of the area, and that's composite stratigraphy from about 20 drill holes that were linked together. Um, and from, unfortunately, three different areas around the Kapushi anticline, okay? So you can see the Kapushi anticline in the, the top right corner. Um, and this is where you can see where we have the um, two potential diapirs, um, which are cutting across the stratigraphy and breaking the stratigraphy. And we've got faults nucleating off them. And then we've got the central part between those two, um, where it is obviously the stratigraphy has been folded during basin inversion, and some of that salt has been brought into the salt anticlinal silt car. Okay. Um, we have the, as you see, the Kapushi mine is located there in that green horizon in the, uh, what would correspond to the Nguba in the, the Gantway. In the, but in here with the map packages, it's the, the Mombe subgroup. Okay. So one of the key horizons in stratigraphic descriptions in the area, they use the Kapushi mine because it is a mine and they've got a great um, exposure of the stratigraphy running through here. But what I found in my work is it's a very condensed stratigraphy and also one of the horizons that is has been called a formation is actually very local to Kapushi, okay? And this is a carbonaceous reduced horizon. So if we're going through the 
the stratigraphy, generally of the copper belt, I found that here I'm missing, actually, I'm missing uh, the lower part of the Congolese stratigraphy, which is quite important to note. So I do not have the mine series um, that we have in the, the um, central Congolese copper belt. And I start in the kind of, the Kinsuki is the, the first um, autochthonous um, formation that forms above the, the Roman salt fracture, okay? And that is representative of an evaporated basins, okay? And then we move on into the lower Mosha and we have kind of mixed siliciclastic and carbonate slope. Um, and then we have the maximum flooding surface in the middle of the, the um, can't wait, which is the carbonaceous shale, which is a great target. It exists over most of the copper belt. And it is very often an exploration target, but I think I'm getting fixated on stratigraphy again. And then we move up into the glacial diamectite of the Grand Conglomerate, which is exposed across the entire shelf, entire um, copper belt and a great stratigraphic marker. Okay, then we move into fine grain carbonates in the lower Kukantwe, which is similar to a Kapushi. Um, and then we have platform kind of carbonates with grainstones and pack stones, not too dissimilar to Kapushi, but then I have um, some red stones, which is dissimilar, and I'm really missing that, that carbonaceous shale. And actually what I found is I actually have some carbonaceous, more organic um, rich um, dolomites kind of in the, the way between the two diapers, kind of showing that, that we've got a, a, a deeper, quieter area, okay? So there's quite a bit of fasces change in the way. okay? Then we move up into a restricted basin in Baphrite. And again, we've got lots of fasces change around these um, diet piers. And the Monwezi is a, just a series of turbidite deposits. Some are finer grained, some are um, coarser grained. And again, we've got organic rich zones in there. So we have a total organic contents um, nearly up to 3.7 percent and these are much richer than the organic content that we had in the washer. Um, so this is a great redox zone. So I've got have very strong redox zones all the way through the, the stratigraphy um, and that includes a 5 percent in the Kutete in the, the restricted evaporite basin. So we've got these wonderful redox layers coming throughout. Okay, um, and then again, we have glacial diamectite from the um, Petty conglomerate. Again, this is a nice um, basin wide correlative unit. Okay, followed by a cap carbonate, which actually has been mineralized in places. So we found mineralization in the Monwezi, vein hosted mineralization in the Monwezi and in the um, Calcare Rose. Um, and that has actually been, been dated um, to actually be uh, as a lithilian, as a orogenic lithilian mineralization. So this, is, this work is really opening up where we can actually look at the parts of the stratigraphy um, which have great potential for mineralization. So we have in situ carbonaceous material throughout the stratigraphy. Um, some of it is potentially migrated hydrocarbons. I'm doing some work to check that. And then we've also got a number of pruritic zones, which are these yellow stars running through the, the stratigraphy as well. Okay. Um, and sorry, just going up to the top sequences up in the, the lower Kundalini, we just have a repetition of turbidite sequences. So this lower Kundalini is not too dissimilar to the, the Monwezi. Um, we've just had a period of quiescence um, during the, the, the glaciation. Okay. 
So after you kind of work out what your stratigraphy is, um, you need to kind of identify these regional timelines. I already mentioned we have other two glaciations running through the, the basin, um, which are great timelines. And we've also got that maximum flooding surface. Um, but we've also got these halokinetic um, compound sequences um, that, um, that form around the, the diapirs. Um, and I've had to model units based on these. So I've had to select modeling units for my cross sections that I'm gonna create um, based on these unconformity packages, okay? Because I need to deconstruct what's going on, okay? Um, and the reason why I want to create a series of cross sections running across the, the regional area is to um, try and understand where we may have uh, major basin structures, which are, are not obvious at surface, um, by looking at kind of thickness changes in the, this, the stratigraphy and also fascia use changes. Okay, sorry. Okay, so this is uh, a first pass cross section running across um, from the north east to the southwest, where we've got that black arrow. Um, and it's basically the, it cuts across um, international borders. So we've got the, the central Congolese copper belt over on the right hand side and the southern Congolese copper belt. Um, and what you can see is we've got a very major thickness change running front between the central Congolese copper belt and the southern Congolese copper belt. And it's crucially right where we have the uh, Kafushi mine. So this indicates that we've got kind of a major basin bounding structure in here. It's not, there's gonna be influence from the salt diapers, but you can see from the extent of the thickness changes, it, it's mostly controlled by being a, a basin controlled architecture, a major fault that's, that's allowing um, accommodation to be created. Okay. And if we've got a nice basin structure there, Maybe this is where the fluids are coming up um, to, uh, uh, for the uh, mineralization, not only perhaps the Kapushi mine, but also for our vein hosted copper mineralization. Okay. So, um, a very basic way of doing this as well is just looking at the stratigraphic thickness variations and the columns. So, this is normally what I do before I create the, the cross sections. Um, so this is a comparison of what's happening running from the, the south, uh, southeast to the northwest. So each of those stars on the map correspond to the, the stratigraphic thickness across this area. So what you can see is Kapushi, again, is pretty much a very compressed section of the stratigraphy. It's not really reflective of what, what's going on here and maybe the reason why we have the mineralization. So it's the stratigraphy is thickening down towards Kapushi East. And then it's also thickening even more significantly to the Northwest, okay? Um, so what we do is we think, okay, so this can start us with the kind of basic ideas of what's going on in, in the basin underneath. Um, and so the obvious thing is we do have the diapir there, but diapir is normally nucleate of normal faults. And you'd expect that there's also maybe another uh, fault trending kind of to northeast southwest. So we've got the down drop section um, to the northwest of Kapushi, and we also appear to have a down drop section from another um, basin structure down to the um, southeast, southwest. Sorry. So we've got this real kind of location. Um, localized basin high where we have the bushy. Okay. So this is my method of looking at kind of really district, a district scale um, basin development to try and understand why the mineralization may be where it is. Um, and it's really kind of changed the way that I approach target generation and how I write targets. The interpretation uh, could not have been achieved without collaboration between exploration companies because they both have brown in very different parts of the stratigraphy. 
So, and it would definitely not have been feasible without actually integrating historical data. It's a very important part of the picture. Um, so the lessons that I've learned from this and I'm taking forward is just don't discount any part of the stratigraphy. Um, and to look for links between basin architecture and near surface structure. Find where you've got reduced fascies or potential hydrocarbon traps. Um, and look for trap sites that channel and concentrate the ore brines. That's quite important in both of these different types of mineralization because we have structures nucleating off the diapers that have concentrated and funneled uh, the, the fluids. Um, and also look at areas where we've got rapid fascies and thickness changes in the stratigraphy. Okay, so thank you. And here are some references which are pertinent. Okay. Thanks, Helen. I think um, I remember very well Helen's Master of Defense and how we all said she had done enough for a PhD. And I am super pleased to see that she is continuing that trend. Um, my uh, first question is actually for you, Helen, so you're not quite off the hook. Um, I was wondering, you know, given that you've been kicking around in the DRC for a while, and so has George, so he can he can chime in. How do you think exploration in this area has changed as a result of the research? Oh, you're going to have to unmute yourself. Um, okay. So, the other thing. So, a lot of the research, most research tends to um focus on deposit kind of size research methods and it's quite useful so we've had quite a few recent researchers um research studies um have been focusing on stratigraphy actually a lot have come out in the recent years and that seems to echo quite a change in the way that exploration companies are working and it's created a framework as well with these papers that have come out of it um, from Kamoa and from Tenke from Rumi. Um, and hopefully some others will come out from my group soon. And I think it's really changing the way that exploration uh, companies are actually looking at working on the ground because it is quite tangible research that exploration geologists can do. Um, some of the other, uh, other work is working on um, alteration halos which can be a little bit more tricky in the copper belt. So was, I think we're still kind of working on that. I've been looking at alteration halos and, and it is tricky. So the traditional part is oh, you've got sodic alteration down in the Zambian side um, and you've got, and with the, um, the orogenic hosted mineralization, you've got kind of a magnesium alteration hosted elsewhere. It's more complicated than Southern Congolese copper anyway. Um, um, and I think, so that's always a bit tricky because as well, a lot of the work is based very much right in, in the deposits and you don't always have the drill holes to work out um, looking at the background, which is an issue I feel um, because you just don't know what's quite normal and what other processes can actually cause that alteration. So it may not be associated with mineralization always, or there may be similar examples which aren't associated with mineralization. Um, a lot of the isotopic work is, is good to do, but it's tricky to apply to exploration, although a lot of um, laboratories are actually starting to include that and make isotopic work um, available. So a lot, yeah, I would say the exploration industry is developing and it's because a lot of laboratories are actually starting to provide these kind of packages that actually enable you to do that. I think George sort of chime in on this man. I'll just remind um, Helen, if you could stop your screen share and I'll pull up my Q&A slide, but mm -hmm. a reminder for our other panelists to turn their cameras on so we can all see them. And then I would say, George, a couple of questions that have come up for you in the chat and one I had is, 
based off of Helen is, um, you know, what sort of unsolved problems are there still um, in the Copper Belt uh, as far as research goes or big questions left? And then there was a question from Karen in the chat about whether or not the, um, the structures that you mentioned host, host the mineralization, is that related to the reductant or, or not? Uh, so on the first one, uh, I'd say there's plenty still to figure out uh, in the copper belt and lots to learn. The With the discovery of Kamo and Kukula, it made other stratigraphic horizons a lot more prospective. Uh, and suddenly people's, I think, uh, view of the copper belt expanded um, dramatically to say, okay, even if uh, the Nguba is not developed, uh, we've learned that it's not restricted to one or two stratigraphic horizons. Where can we get the correct um, combination of factors to form these types of deposits? Um, where are we getting the, the, the mineralizing fluids being transported to that can mineralize in any prospective horizon? Um, and so I think the whole, from a time scale, that whole rifting event suddenly becomes a lot more prospective across a much wider area, much wider. So now it's starting to straddle various countries. You know, it's not just the Congo, um, Zambian copper belts, you know, you're looking into, and there've been discoveries into uh, Kalahari, into Botswana. Uh, is that part of the same system? Is that a different system? Is, are they all interlinked? Um, you know, what is the relationship? Is this mineralizing system happening over an even bigger um, area than we thought before. Uh, so suddenly you've stepped out and you look at it a bit, bit more broadly and you think, wow, actually there's a huge amount of ground that needs to now be tested and explored. Um, so, and a lot of companies have, have done, done that and picked up ground in places that were never really on companies' radars. Um, so I think that's, that's, and there's lots of research now as to figure out what's controlling these systems and how to vector into them as quickly as possible. Um, so I, I think a very exciting part of the world to be if you're looking for copper. Um, in terms of the question around the structures, um, so yes, the structures do seem, you, you're definitely getting fluid coming up them. In fact, some of the best soil samples we have is where mineralization seems to have sort of leaked out of these structures to surface. Uh, and that this is one of these things you get familiar with in your area is the best soil samples often in a completely different place to where your best deposit is. It just happens to be close to a structure, doesn't relate to higher grade mineralization nearby. Um, but if there's not a reductant, we're not seeing mineralization along those structures. Um, what you find is that there'll be a reductant 300 meters up that's way too far above the, the aquifer and suddenly in a little area, it picks up mineralization. Uh, so that indicates that there's flow that's intersecting that unit, uh, but it won't mineralize much. You know, you'll get maybe one or two holes that pick up sniffs of it and then it's gone. Uh, so very localized around structures. Um, but we haven't encountered structures that are um, showing copper mineralization or, or sort of, you know, dripping with native copper or anything like that. Yeah, but they're definitely there. Um, they just haven't left a signature in terms of mineralization. Yeah, I think that really speaks to what we've all heard is that you need the sort of source, transport, and trap. And we've learned that from the very beginning. You need all three of those. And it's great to hear that. I'm sure that, you know, you sort of pushed into the Western Foreland. So I'm sure that like some of the, uh, what you were mentioning about the discoveries uh, moving outward into places you wouldn't necessarily expect are informing that. And I think it speaks to Jamie's point about how we just need more and more discoveries going forward since we're going to have a lot of demand for copper. And Jamie, I think there's a there's a question to you being sort of sat, sat in the chat for a while now. Can you sort of speak to, um, especially in the US, we talk a lot about permitting and getting new mines permitted and how that's a problem when we're talking about a green resource transition. We need to make more money. We need to find things, but we also need to be able to permit mines. So can you sort of speak to the US's strategy on that and, and permitting? And then maybe um, Helen or George can chime in for other countries that they've worked in. Yeah, I mean, in terms of uh, 
again, coming at it from the USGS side where we're not a regulatory agency. So for us, it's a matter of seeing what we see. We, we don't make policy. It's, it's kind of nice as being a scientist and not policy. Um, but one of the things is there's the anecdotal number of it's a minimum of 10 years before you can actually start putting the hole in the ground in the United States. And so when the initial call for say the, the critical minerals executive orders had gone out, that was one of the concerns was, can the US get more competitive um, in those permitting processes? Because again, we have a particularly, you know, the case of copper, if there is that material out there, there are other countries who are actively, they're moving faster in terms of trying to get those um, permitting times down. Canada in particular has done a lot of work into basically consolidating all their permits into one package so that that can be kind of handled in a much uh, more streamlined way. In terms of how, um, especially because they were asking, you know, how are we incorporating them into the models? There's a lot of work that still needs to be done. And I know the folks um, at University of Nevada, Reno um, in particular, um, have been doing some of the work of just we have idea anecdotal evidence for how long it takes you know from discovery or moving from greenfield to an actual mine but there hasn't been honestly a ton of work in getting like a set of the number of how good is the deposit before you know how long it's at so we we don't have the kind of numbers that we could put into you know a quantitative model yet but i know for a fact there are people who are working on that and so that's going to be one of those things of getting that quantitative statistical data that you know we can factor in but from our house um anytime we're looking at it in the united states it's well, if it's going to happen, it's minimum of 10 years. So, okay, the actionable stuff is probably not so much in the United States anytime soon. And even then, um, there had been questions about, you know, the other areas where you have either, whether it's just environmental or just even just civil disturbances. I mean, that's where Peru in the recent years, um, that was a 30% reduction in copper output in the second largest copper producer um, because of that scenario. So, and that's one of the things, you know, when we talked about that HHI of how concentrated production is, that's one of the things that we kind of keep as a metric of, if it's very concentrated, something like that happening can have a huge impact. Now, fortunately, compared to other commodities, copper Lots of countries are producing copper. Yes, Chile is producing the most of it, but there's a lot of fingers and a lot of pies who are adding to that supply. So it's not great if one company goes offline, those kind of things. But there are other company, you know, other countries who can kind of pick up slack. It's very different in some of these commodity, you know, you talk about um, something like the platinum metals. Something happens in South Africa that's, you know, that, that's half the world's inventory, right? So those are the kind of things when we're comparing them, it's, you know, apples to apples, copper is in a much better scenario uh, situation than some of these materials. But again, um, we don't have numbers right now that we could say, you know, put into a model, this is the outline of permitting. It is a long time and the US is very long. Um, and then you look at places like Western Europe. Yes, there's some stuff happening in Portugal, Spain, Ireland, but then you talk about, okay, the Cooper sphere extends in uh, sedimentary copper belt in Germ uh, Poland that's being mined, extends into Germany. Do you really think that's going to be exploited? Probably not, um, but they're facing the same issues and uh, demand for copper going forward. So, I mean, those are the things that um, when we're doing those models, it's kind of the, okay, we know it's there. Is it going to be exploited? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, fair enough. And I think, you know, it's interesting because we talk a lot about the vulnerability of markets. We might not say that copper is a vulnerable market, but could you speak to related markets like tellurium and cobalt? And I know that that comes into play with the copper belt as well. So maybe George and Helen can talk about that. I mean, um, vulnerable in the sense of prices can go across the board and copper is relatively expensive, right? Um, compared mm -hmm. to something like aluminum. So, I mean, yes, if you're a manufacturer, that hurts a lot. I'm not trying to dismiss that, you know, people's pocketbooks are taking a dive. It, it's more a matter though of um, when we're thinking of things and just like the ge geostrategic level of they're not, it can't be cut off and there's none of it. Um, versus if we talk about some of those minor metals like gallium, 96% of world supply is controlled by one country. That can be an existential crisis versus copper. This could be a real big price pain. Um, and so that's really when I, when I say that, you know, the, that mm -hmm. tightness, it's a more matter of this is going to hurt our pocketbook versus we don't have this. Um, those are the two kind of different scales that we look at things, uh, yeah. you know, is the terms of that risk. Yeah, I think from a um, 
from a, the for the copper belts. I mean, the the countries in the copper belts have relied heavily on the exports from that copper belt, um, both cobalt, copper, and other metals, um, and they're very aware of that. Uh, and certainly at the moment, we're finding very um, you know, legislative frameworks or certainly governments that are very supportive of, of further work because they can see the advantage it would have. Like a discovery like Kamaka Kula has completely transformed that area uh, and the whole um, of the province has benefited from that discovery. And so I think people are, are aware of that. Obviously, if things go really well, then people start to see the super profits that are coming out and it starts to get uh, a bit too tempting. Um, but I think something that companies, and I, this is something I've been really impressed with with Ivanhoe, um, is you, if you're coming in as, a, as an organization that's trying to maximize shareholder return regardless of anything else, you're just in for the profits and that's all that's driving your exploration and your mining, um, you're gonna have a lot of friction. Uh, if you're coming in saying, we want to be transformative wherever we go, obviously we have shareholders who are wanting a return, but we are not just coming in to try and make money and leave. We're coming in to do things that will have a lasting impact. Um, that is seen by governments and accepted in a very favorable light because you're coming alongside them saying, we're gonna support you. Uh, so one example, just, to, just so you can see what I mean, is uh, a lot of companies, they need power. Power can be a problem. They set up a little power plant next to their mine. They use it. Uh, they fund, they, you know, their mine does what it needs to. When it runs out, the power plant shuts down and that's the end of it. And the country sees no benefit. Um, whereas we've gone in and rehabilitated hydro schemes. Um, and the power from those hydro schemes doesn't come straight to our mine. It's fed onto the national grid. Um, and we then draw it off the grid. So we're supplying extra power onto the grid and then drawing it off, stabilizing the grid. Any excess is available for the country. It means it's harder admin, et cetera, but the government is saying if the mine shuts down at some point in the future, the power plant is still running. The benefit from all of that work is still in place for the country. And if you do that in numerous um, fronts of a numerous things, agriculture, power, water, um, and you say, we need these things, we will help you develop these things, but these will be available to you broadly. Um, it's mining companies have to think like that going forward, uh, particularly for something like cobalt. You know, the DLC is it. And unless someone finds some amazing cobalt dis deposit somewhere, we have to accept that the DLC is, is where we're getting our cobalt from. Um, and I don't think that's a problem. We've been operating a DLC for years, mm -hmm. um, uh, but it's how you approach it. You know, it's really important. Yeah, I think that that's, you know, oh, Jamie, if you want to follow up. Go for well, it, absolutely. And I think the United States is one of the more unique positions as being one of the countries that can say, we can just be have a NIMBY uh, situation where we don't want it in our backyard because it's mining is important and it adds dollars to the US economy, but it's not the US economy versus some of these countries that are particularly resource-based. They are really going to be reliant on some of these projects. And the other thing is these projects especially some of the, the pit mines you're talking about, these are decadal scale projects. You don't open this and close it in a year. And so that's one of those big things that we're also kind of seeing is, okay, are companies trying to just, you know, fleece the sheep and get some money from royalties or are they then go, moving into resource nationalism? And so you'll see some countries then the challenge is, okay, do they try to nationalize these industries and then, oops, sometimes they kill them uh, because they are mismanaged. Uh, sometimes that might work that they try to say, okay, you can mine here, but you can't export the material. You have to try to build a refinery and smelter to add that value chain to our borders. Indonesia tried to do this a couple of years back. That's where a lot of the interesting stuff's kind of happening is where countries are seeing, especially resource-based countries are saying, look, there's money to be had. If we're just exporting ores, maybe we're losing extra parts of that value chain. Maybe we should be doing some of the stuff here. And so it's, is it policy dishes, decisions? Are companies doing it? That's where there's a lot of kind of exciting things happening. Yeah, I think so. And I think, you know, just broadly, we're talking about more mining. We're also going to have to talk about more ESG considerations. I mean, we can't simply mine irresponsibly in other countries. Um, I think that, uh, you know, Helen's presentation really showed that 
regional data sets are very important. And I want to get to a question that Marie Hitzman asked in the in the chat for George. How do you get companies to do more regional geology to provide that necessary context when you're exploring? Uh, how do you get, uh, sorry, just to clarify, how, how would you get companies to collaborate or how do you get your own company to do more? Let's do both, <laughs> very quickly. Okay. Um, well, I suppose your own company um, is being able to show the value of that to, mm -hmm. to management to show that, yes, it's going to cost money to collect this data and it's going to take time, but it's going to save a lot of money because of the way you can interpret that. Uh, and there are more and more tools available to gain as much out of that data as possible. Um, so we're seeing a lot of move into data analysis uh, and how you can extract maximum value out of that. Um, in terms of how would we collaborate more widely, it, it's difficult because companies want to hold a competitive advantage or a first mover into a new area. Uh, how who's going to benefit if this collaboration leads to something um, as a company? I think that's going to take a very mature approach. I think many mining, my perspective is many mining companies hold on to data very tightly and don't want to share it, even if there's no real competitive advantage. You have established mines next to each other. Um, the licenses are locked up for decades. No one's going to lose anything. You're going to both gain from understanding what's happening across your boundary. But companies, for some reason, close up shop and won't share. Uh, and I think that's very foolish. Um, but it's a reality. Uh, and often you'll find people on the ground are very willing to share. And as soon as you move up a chain of management, you get to some level and everything just stops. Um, so I think there's certainly a lot on the geologists to explain. We would learn so much more about our deposit if we had access to that data. And if we shared our data, with them and they shared with us, we would both benefit. Um, and there won't be some sort of uh, competitive, competitive advantage that's given up. Um, but in regional projects, regional data sets, it becomes very difficult. And unfortunately that becomes uh, a hindrance. Yeah. And I think having that data available would, uh, particularly when we're doing things like, it does uh, byproduct commodities, the fact that yes, when you're doing some of these assays, Yes, okay, if a company is a mining, uh, you know, a copper company, yeah, that report makes it, the copper makes it into their 43 101s, maybe some of the other minor, um, you know, gold, precious metals. But when we're trying to say, okay, well, what's the indium inventory, the rhenium inventory, tellurium inventories look like? If that data isn't being published by, you know, the ones who are actually doing the chemical assays, we have no ability to make these inventories. And that's the, just the single most hair pulling data gap that we're seeing as we're trying to, you know, okay, how much is actually out there? How much baby are we throwing out with the bathwater in terms of mining these, uh, you know, when we mine copper, how much of the byproducts are we losing? But if that data doesn't exist and if it's not being published by those who have the best access to it, it's gone. And I mean, yeah, it's sometimes it's a nightmare. I mean, indium used to be the what you'd use as the internal standard for ICPMS. So, okay, that's gonna be a real one, hard one to measure, but like, if we don't have that data, we're really struggling with byproduct inventories. And so that's one of those things going forward when you know the companies are sitting on data, it's you share the extra stuff that not just the one that you're gonna make money on, no one's gonna to try to scoop you on the tellurium content or whatever, but it helps us understand how much is actually out there to build inventories. Yeah, and I think that you know that that's definitely what the USGS is trying to do with the CMMI project. So data sharing, if there's a plea for that, <laughs> certainly Jamie's making it. Um, and I know that there are a lot of questions in the chat and Helen is busily answering a few now, I can tell. I'd like to kind of wrap things up with one final question. And given that this webinar is really tailored to students and ECPs, I'd just like, or early career professionals, I'd really like each panelist uh, to say kind of what the primary takeaway might be for students and early career professionals from their point of view, from their presentation that are looking to get into the copper game. So um, Jamie, let's start with you. Well, again, um, speaking in terms of uh, maybe not as much as copper in general, but just economic uh, geology and in the exploitation side, it's 
when you're doing your research and everything, don't let yourself just be siloed. One of the big things that we're seeing demand for are people who can kind of have a little bit of expertise in, a, in everything. And there's a buzzword going right ar now, around right now, they're calling it um, geometallurgy, right? But the geologists should are most helpful if they have some understanding of the mining engineering or the processing techniques, because you're better able to describe the inventory that you found. Um, you're able to say, hey, this is a great deposit, but we can't sort out some of these materials. This will be affecting the processing. It's stay curious, especially if you're in the, you know, in the early stage of researching. If you're interested in deposits, great. But also, if you want to do anything further on or larger scale with it, be interested in what happens next with the deposits, because then you can really make big contributions and really kind of move and shake some of these things. Yeah, uh, George, you next. Uh, I think my my perspective would be uh, it's a very exciting time to be getting into industry. Um, I think for many years, miners have just kind of got on with things and people have lost sight of, of where their supply chains are coming from and where things are actually sourced. And it's all been about what we can make with these metals. And um, But with the transition to green energy and the focus on that going forward, I think there's a very strong realization amongst industry um, globally that uh, that we don't have enough of what we might need and uh, uh, and people are starting to look at miners in a with a lot more sort of importance and saying if we're going to achieve what we want to achieve you guys have to succeed you have to find these things uh, and it's really really important that this happens uh, and so we sit with problems like climate change and sometimes we might see these problems as you know, there was the HIV crisis. You might look at healthcare workers, and they must sort it out. And and uh, you know, and and we are now sitting with one of these crises in our hands for us to solve. Uh, being able to find the metals we need is critical in the next ten years, twenty years. Um, and I think the focus is back, um, as as Robert Friedland, our, our chairman, says, uh, "It's the revenge of the miners." You know, <laughs> we've been quiet for too long, and it's time to time to see our importance in the global industry. Uh, so it's very exciting. I, I think it's a brilliant time to be getting into industry, copper in particular, but but there's a whole host of, of metals that are becoming very, very interesting uh, going forward. I, I absolutely love that, Revenge of the Miners. And I think, uh, you know, Jamie and George, your two career paths show that there's a lot of room for whatever you want being an exploration geologist to look like as well. Um, and then Helen, let's end with you. Um, so with the early careers, I guess, and the students coming through, we've got a, a difficult life to live. We've got to find all these resources and we've got to do it as cleanly as we can. And um, so we're the people on the ground that can do that. And I think we're all motivated to actually do the best we can. And one of the best ways we can do is to actually find new resources as efficiently as possible and to use the data that we already have as as well as we can so make sure we use all that geophysics and all that multiple implement data and all the historical drill holes and we don't have like a bigger kind of environmental footprint from our exploration activities and we really need to and we need to make sure that we we work with everyone on the ground because the face of of mining the face of exploration is very much it's changed considerably since i started and it's definitely for the better I'm really sure and it's going to continue to to improve and to be you know to involve the voices of the whole society and it's very important that we keep chatting to each other and we also keep on top of our um, kind of continued kind of professional development it's one of the things that I'd also slightly second part but if we're going to keep improving our exploration methods we've got to keep in touch with research and keep going to conferences and keep our training up. So that's very important too, which is what SEG is great at. Yeah. I can think of no better place to end on. <laughs> with that, uh, let's talk about some upcoming events very quickly, some upcoming SEG events. One I'd like to point out is the second installment of this series. So this is a four part series and the next one in June, we'll be talking about zinc. And uh, I'm, I'm hoping everyone here is, is registered, but 
SEG is hosting its next annual conference for 2003 in London from August 26th to 29th. The chosen theme is uh, resourcing the green transition. So we're going to talk a lot about critical met metals, critical materials, and ESG. Also for 2023, there are a lot of field trips and workshops that are being planned to expand on the technical program of the conference. Just a note that the student registrations are very heavily discounted for those. So take advantage of that while you, while you can. And registration is now open. There's still some spots on those field trips. So look for that. And there's a final thank you. One big thank you to our sponsors, MapTech, once again. And thank you to our panelists. George, Jamie, and Helen. And thanks to everybody that participated. I know there are a lot of qu chat questions that didn't get answered. Reach out to the panelists on LinkedIn via email uh, and make sure, you know, connect with them. And I'm sure that they'll be happy to answer any questions you still have. Thank you, everybody. I'm going to let everyone go now since that we're running a bit over time. <laughs>